Is it safe? We each got a new cell phone. Talk on it once, you toss it. How about we untrace it? Hello, Hugo Mountbatten here. Mr. Carmine, how you doing? I'm splendid, thank you. But you know how it is inside. How much did that Rico fiasco cost you? A lot. We do this already? Of course, darling. So, that rotter, TGV, insulted you, did he? That's correct. What exactly did he say? He made a very hurtful remark. It's not worth repeating. I heard it was something about Seiko being better than Rolex. It's only been alleged something was said. He allegedly said what he said to a group of people. Friends of ours. How do you know it's true? I'm not at liberty to say. With all due respect, but this is bullshit. Somebody in my family's talking out of school and you're not at liberty to say who? I should be making the beef here. I hate to say it, chaps, but Tony is correct. Let's stick to the issue. Well, what on earth do you want done about it? If this were years ago, would I even have had to ask? Steady on, old boy. John, what about one of his lovely watches? Is clipping him gonna unring that bell? Nobody's getting clipped. I want satisfaction. How about he makes an apology uh, on that uh, little YouTube channel of his? That ship has sailed. You're being unreasonable, John. There are millions of dollars at stake. Again with the money? Yeah, again with the money. It's so, John. Johnny, darling. Johnny? Johnny. Johnny, darling, are you there? Okay, hi guys and welcome to the show and today we are, we are, non mi sento giusto vestito così, cambio. Okay, now look at this, much better, huh? much better, right? <laughs> Where has Velour been all my life? God, I could sleep in this. I, I totally get it. I totally get the velour tracksuit now. All right, so as you probably guessed, we're gonna be discussing the watches of The Sopranos. But aside from Tony's Day Date, which obviously is the most famous watch of them all, there was a ton of great timepieces in the show that I spotted because I recently re-watched the whole thing and uh, I can't tell you how uh, superbly written it was and intelligently written you know I kind of forgot you know so it's been fantastic re-watching it and of course I spotted a ton of great watches including a Seiko Flightmaster yes the flighty can you believe it so more on that later now first of all I gotta say um, uh, I had the honor of, of, of getting to know some of the people involved in the show uh, rest in peace Dennis because of course I lived in uh, Queens for, for almost, well, over 10 years. It was filmed predominantly at Silver Cup Studios uh, in Long Island City. Enough waffling, let's talk about some watches. But first, like my watch reviews, a little bit of history to contextualize. The Sopranos revolutionized television in a pre-online streaming world. We forget now how daring it was in presenting a more believable depiction of a certain Italian-American subculture when everything else on TV was so clean cut and toned down. Before The Sopranos, TV was seen as a second fiddle to movies. And now we see movie stars featuring in all kinds of serialized shows. When it first aired in 1999, it ran for six seasons, totaling 86 glorious episodes until 2007 winning a ton of awards, a lot of critical analysis, controversy, and parody. For me, I was just starting to work in the music industry in New York during the last season, and recording would come to a complete standstill in the studio just to watch the show each week. In fact, I would often be scheduled to work that day so the clients could have me translate the Italian slang words used by the characters. This isn't gonna work, I can't talk about my personal life. Finish telling me about the day you collapsed. 
The Sopranos not only set trends in its format, but it was clever, incredibly so. David Chase's writing was funny, dark, poignant, insightful, and above all, entertaining. It didn't spoon feed the audience, nor did it patronize them. It often ventured into the abstract and made esoteric cultural references while still being a show about gangsters. It had hidden depths that has helped it stand the test of time and is almost infinitely rewatchable. My belly button was a Phillips head screw and I'm working on screwing it and when I get it unscrewed my penis falls off. On one level, you can enjoy it as a straightforward depiction of how gangsterism bleeds into a suburban domestic life. And on a deeper level, it was a commentary on the whole human condition. But ultimately, it was all exacerbated by putting it in the context of a criminal lifestyle. Anyway, what am I gonna do with it? I already got one and Mr. Williams here, he don't play, right? Stupid the f***ing game. The Sopranos has had something of a resurgence in interest of late, and younger generations are now discovering it, who may have missed it the first time around. This very much inspired me to revisit it myself, and with Instagram accounts like Soprano Style documenting every wonderful shirt Tony wore, naturally, watches also played a big part. Right, so let's start with the obvious watch out of the way first. Of course, the Rolex Day Day. Now this is my wristwatch check and it's my personal, this is the, uh, let me see if I can remember this, 18238. He actually had the 18038, which is the same version I had before with the champagne dial. This is of course the linen dial, I upgraded because of the difference between them. This has the double quick set. Uh, so I believe he had the fi uh, single quick set and it was a little bit thicker as well. That's how you generally tell uh, the difference between them, but essentially, very, very similar. Um, it's a perfect watch for him. It's the ultimate go-to gangster watch, the captain of industry watch. I've talked about this before, so have a look back at my previous videos. I've discussed the history of this watch. It's no surprise that this brand is worn by so many and with so much screen time. After all, it is perhaps the most recognized power jewelry. And if you are late on your payments, instantly liquefiable. There are datejusts galore. Fiorio Giunta, played by Federico Castelluccio, is a great example, before changing to Zenith later on. But a few honorable mentions we should cover include the irritatingly spoiled Meadow, played by Jamie Lynn Sigler, wearing a Daytona. The Daytona is also worn by Albert Alleyboy Barisi, played by Richard Maldone. Another notable mention is the aftermarket red dial and blinged out day date worn by the amusingly named Sal Big Pussy Bon Pensiero, played by Vincent Pastore. But going back to Tony, he wasn't always wearing a Rolex. In fact, in the pilot episode, you can clearly see him wearing a different kind of yellow gold tone watch, which I have always suspected as being a tag higher because of its bracelet. If anybody does know what this watch is, please do share in the comments. His pinky ring also changed from all diamond to one featuring a ruby. I suspect it was another uh, David Chase hidden meaning. Rubies, of course, being a favorite among the powerful in the ancient world. Okay, so now we're gonna talk about Cartier and it's a brand favored by Christopher Moltisanti, which is interesting, it translates to many saints. Um, again, David Chase, very clever, but anyway, we'll, we'll, yeah, you can read into that as much as you want. But also his partner in the show, Adriana Leserva, they both wore Cartier a lot. In fact, Christopher, I think, got robbed in one particular scene, if I remember, of his Cartier. It's a very classy brand. It's actually a family tradition in my family, um, not that kind of family. Uh, my wife has a Cartier Tango I gave her, my mum has one. It's a family tradition. It's an old world brand. Christopher, played superbly by the great Michael Imperioli, certainly had a taste for luxury cars and classic wristwatches. He quickly progressed up the family ladder, mainly due to nepotism rather than actual cunning or strength. As he made more money, he was able to obtain nicer things, and he certainly had a penchant for predominantly Cartier. He wore a gold Cartier Pasha grille during the fourth season. 
It's easy to spot as it's so distinctive with the protective bars that were deliberately inspired by the first wristwatches that had them to protect the glass from damage. And this is an age way before sapphire glass, of course. It's a nice reminder of how old Cartier is, even if sadly today they are not given the respect by most watch enthusiasts they absolutely deserve. In the end, and I note there are no spoilers here, he sported the fantastic Cartier Roadster. I adore this watch as I love Art Deco myself, and as the name implies, this automatic Roadster from 2001 was inspired by the automobiles of that stylish age. Okay, next is one of my favorite characters, Furio <laughs> from Naples. I really enjoyed him because uh, I especially loved when he broke into Italian. It was, it was great to see that with that Neapolitan accent. I think he brought some verisimilitude and, and veracity to the, uh, to the show that was, it, it played in beautifully. Now, what's interesting about Furio is he went originally, in the beginning, he went down the typical route. I can't remember if it was a day date or a date just, we just saw a little flash of it. But then, sure enough, he got a little bit more kind of sophisticated and he ended up with this Zenith chronograph, which was a real surprise. Zenith, of course, being uh, a very important uh, brand when it comes to developing one of the first automatic, the El Primero that we've discussed many, many times on the show. Okay, next is another wonderful character with some extremely darkly comedic lines that I will never forget. We are, of course, talking about Johnny Sack, the, the, uh, the boss of New York, or Johnny Sacramone, if we're going to be correct about it. Now, he was not only a very dapper chap indeed, uh, I, I loved his, his wardrobe, but uh, also his choice of watch was very, very deliberate because it is the Piaget Polo, which was more popular in the 80s and, and early 90s, but it has a real world connotation with um, certain, as Johnny Sack put it, bosses of the Italian American subculture, right? John Gotti was aware of this piece. It's very distinctive with those engraved lines. It's completely minimalist, hardly anything on the dial. Uh, it's immediately recognizable. Also, the alleged boss of uh, a certain uh, organization here in Philadelphia. I love how it took inspiration from the real world as well. The Piaget Polo is perhaps the most iconic watch that the brand is known for and first debuted in 1979. But as those who watch my channel will know, from a watch enthusiast's perspective, they are respected for a long history of making some of the world's thinnest mechanical watches with the Altiplano and the equally impressive tourbillons they also produce. Johnny Sack, played masterfully by Vincent Curatola, has the quintessential solid gold slimline quartz that is very dressy and features an integrated bracelet. This was emblematic of the jet set Wall Street new money types throughout the 80s and perfectly suits his character. Piaget has since reinvented the polo in 2016 into a more Gerald Genta inspired Patek Nautilus-esque style sports watch. Okay, next is a watch that wasn't actually worn on the show, but it was given uh, from Tony to cousin Brian, the, the cousin of Carmela, uh, and it was a Patek. The watch featured was the Patek Philippe annual calendar reference 50371G. Brian erroneously underestimates the watch's value at 15 grand when thanking Tony. In reality, this more gaudy, blinged out white gold version of the dress watch is closer to actually to 50 grand. David Chase is a genius when it comes to writing, and this is a prime example of a subtle but clever deliberate indication of the character's general lack of knowledge. Now, to be clear, I'm not saying that a person is not knowledgeable if they don't know the price of every Patek, but it does highlight a consistent trend in the Brian character, which is what Chase was undoubtedly going for. Now is one of my favorite watches. And when I discovered this, much to my wife's annoyance, I was rewinding, zooming in again and again. And every time this guy was on the screen, I was like, uh, you know, I was all over it. We are, of course, talking about 
uh, Carlo's uh, Flight Master. Yes, the Seiko Flight Master, a favorite of the channel, a favorite of mine, a favorite of the Gentry. Uh, an un unbelievable watch and uh, yeah you, you could spot it because of that domed hard legs and the bezel but what really gave it away was the uh, the bracelet it has a very distinctive center link that has a groove and there's nothing else out there like it uh, that ticked all those boxes so it had to be a flight master um, yeah it kind of blew my mind when I saw it I was so happy <laughs> but a great choice because of course even though it's a pilot's watch it has that unbeatable water resistance of 200 meters which is perfect when you have to uh, wash away DNA evidence so there you go next is Corrado Soprano or known to most of us as Junior or Uncle June or or June. Uh, he is one of, <laughs> one of the most memorable characters. Amazing lines he had of dialogue. Just, uh, you know, it had me in hysterics or had us in hysterics, right? Do you play uh, Manatee or what's that other one? Will you let the man tee you off? You got worse than six barbers. Now, what's interesting about his watch is I always presumed it was a, it was a date just, a Rolex date just, the two-tone Jubilee bracelet, the rest of it. Uh, because of course it wasn't a day date because they only make day dates in precious metals. But then during his decline into dementia, we saw he left it on the, uh, the, uh, the bedside table, that's it. And we saw a close up of it and I was really dismayed because of course it can only be a fake day date. Maybe he got it during one of uh, his nefarious uh, criminal activities, who knows. But uh, yeah, it was a little surprising to see. In a hilarious scene using an inner monologue, the character Vito Spatafore, played by Joseph R. Ganascoli, wore a stainless steel Oris world timer. Definitely an unusual, tasteful choice compared to the watches of his fellow wise guys. This particular world timer allows for a second time zone to be easily tracked with a subdial at the 3 o'clock. Adjusting it is made easy via the pushes at 4 and 8 o'clock. To fit the character better, the XL version of this Swiss automatic was chosen, and I suspect also to be more legible to the audience too, as the watch was wonderfully utilised in this scene to great comedic effect. It also, the brand popped up in the Ben Kingsley, uh, the, <laughs> the, the Hollywood episode where Chrissy and one of the, his associates go to um, try and have a meeting with Sir Ben Kingsley and he actually takes one, I think, to give us a gift. So Oris was featured quite visibly and even referred to by name in the show, which I, I was quite amazed by. In fact, so much so, I, I, I thought it was perhaps a, uh, a product placement. Who knows? So, cheer me up, babe. Just when I thought I was out, they pulled me back. Okay guys, so I'm going to leave it there. Uh, now, I've probably left out a few watches, well, it's inevitable, so please do nominate uh, or mention any of them down in the comments. I could have sworn I saw a Navi timer, but I, thinking back now, I think I may have, <laughs> I may have dreamt it. But anyway, um, thank you so much for watching. Uh, what else? Oh, there's the Instagram, there's the UG uh, official store with the merchandise, uh, Facebook, blah, blah, blah. You know the drill now, you know the drill. Um, thank you so much for watching. Please don't forget to like this video if you enjoyed it, found it useful. And as always, yeah, ci vediamo in the next one. Okay, ciao.